So thank you very much, Maharaj, for joining today for this discussion. It's an honor to have you with us. And we are having these Hmong podcasts as discussions on uh, topics where the bhakti wisdom intersects with the uh, with the search for understanding and the broader discourse that's happening in the society. So we basically are targeting these discussions for uh, for anyone who is interested in spirituality, especially interested in bhakti spirituality, and also wants to understand wh how bhakti concepts can be uh, presented and discussed. Uh, with a general audience in perspective. Okay, so, thank you, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. It's always a pleasure uh, being in some discussions with you. We've spent many, many hours over the last so many years having many pleasant and meaningful discussions. So I'm glad that we have this opportunity once again. Yes, and thank you. Time, uh, public forum like this. Yes, nice. thank you very much uh, for all the time you have discussed and guided me. So today, I thought we could discuss on the topic of veganism and bhakti. And uh, I would like to talk about this in broadly, if it is okay with you, just three broad terms. You know, we could discuss about uh, you know the the rise of the vegan movement and how that is a how that is actually a very positive sign then we will talk about how at some places uh, the vegan being a vegan and being bhakti uh, sometimes uh, diverges and uh, so how veganism in, indicates a rise in human consciousness or how sometimes it diverges with bhakti and how those who where it diverges, how we could address those issues. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everything you said is right. These are the three important points. Why did veganism, you know, rise at all in the first place? And uh, where does it diverge from bhakti? From the way we look at things, there are some fundamental differences. Yes. Uh, I would say that um, we have a lot in common with the vegans. Mm. There is a lot we agree upon. And there are some things we don't agree with. Upon, yes. see? So I think in the course of this discussion, perhaps we can um, discuss both aspects. Yes. Uh, yes. Discussing what is in common, what we both agree on, isn't a problem because yeah it's easy but where we differ is where probably we will need more discussion i i believe yes yes Maharaj. and especially what would be the bhakti perspective on veganism right yes so from what i have read or understood there have been uh, three factors which uh, Led to the led to the rising of what some people call as animal consciousness, and in fact, or the vegan awareness. So one was that we you first is the sheer scale of uh, animal farming that is happening, that is just uh, unprecedented in human history. Then the second was not just the scale, but the brutality with which it was done. Hmm. She, uh, the complete commercialization and heartlessness with which it was done and the third is there is overall uh, because of an egalitarian ethos there has been at least in some sections of society an increased concern for those who are underprivileged or those who are victimized so that idea of victimization has also extended beyond human society. So in specific places, certain things could be, certain factors would have played more role and less role. In, but these are the three broad things. 
so that's what i had some thoughts i think if i could put it in one word it would be industrialization the industrialization of animal rearing the yes. industrialization of animal farming the industrialization of meat eating because when you talk of industrialization you talk of something done in a mass scale you talk yes. of something done in a very organized manner and even in industrialization when it deals with um, uh, you know uh, commodities just ordinary commodities which are not alive there is a degree of insensitivity that comes in mm. an impersonalism that comes in and naturally when there is an industrial industrial approach towards animal farming so there will also be an increased uh, kind of impersonalism and animal farming anyway is cruel per se and then you bring in the whole industrialized industrialization concept and superimpose it on that uh, and do it on a mass scale like this then the it, it just takes cruelty to just another level so i think because the cruelty increased to such humongous proportions and it became so in your face so to speak and so brazen uh that any human being you know who is sensitive would be uh very much taken aback or hurt or you know very concerned about it uh would be shocked mm-hmm. and yes i think over the years also there has been shall we say you use the word egalitarian ethos uh, let's say a a, a a liberalization of of world views okay and opening up or a liberalization of of world views is probably so i think you're right so the contribution of the industrialization of animal farming coupled with a liberalization of world views in mm-hmm. general especially in the western world that has probably contributed to this yes that's true there are i have read some commentaries of course these are by devotees who say that among the eastern versions of spirituality that went to the west uh, prabhupada was the first major spiritual teacher who emphasized on vegetarianism most other spiritual teachers did not and in some ways uh, prabhupada was a pioneer in providing tangible alternatives to people because for for many people in the west to eat to be vegetarian they thought it means simply to eat vegetables so so that could all i have not in detail examined historically that claim but from what i know about many of the other teachers whether from the hindu tradition or from the buddhist tradition not many have in themselves emphasized uh, vegetarianism as a as a as a important a pillar of spiritual life so yes and not only that i think what shila prabhupada also um bitterly condemned and criticized is the mass slaughterhouses organized slaughterhouses you know he he does give a hierarchy of levels of consciousness of people Hmm. and the people who are most cultured most civilized most uh, spiritually compatible who really have refined consciousness and who are very sensitive uh, to the pain of others who do want spiritually they would never kill animals they would never cause pain to other living beings so that goes without saying but then shri prabhupada explains the whole hierarchy that the whole world is not going to be full of such people you know at least not in this day and age in the age of kali the kali yuga so the vedic scriptures gave sanction to people of lower consciousness and gave a kind of a, or a permission to do something that was not ideal by higher standards but still it was something that was permitted because uh, at least there was some authority they were following it was done to be done in a certain manner Hmm. Um, following a certain procedure, 
And it was usually done on an individual level or on a small scale. So that was bad enough. I mean, he didn't in any way try to justify that. He criticized that as well. Uh, but he said, if you have to, if you really have to and you can't do without it, then at least do this and don't kill the higher animals, especially the cow and the bull. You know, it's not that he was saying it's okay to kill the other animals, but he was saying if you just have to, then mm. at least avoid killing the cow, then kill the lower animals and do it in a small scale. But today, he used to say what we have is these large scale organized slaughterhouses and the whole society is just gearing up um, and eating meat and not realizing the kind of pain and cruelty that is inflicted on these animals. So he especially hit out at the organized slaughterhouse civilization. I think that very boldly he, he spoke out, this was in the 60s. Yeah. And I think that was much before the, uh, the vegan movement. I think the vegan movement really started something like the 1940s or something like that in UK. That was when it started. It was a, a kind of a splinter group of the uh, vegetarian society or something like that over there. And they decided that being vegetarian is not enough. You must also avoid any animal products. Yeah. So it took many decades for the vegan uh, philosophy to really become popular. But yes. Prabhupada popularized the vegetarian philosophy and even more than that, the, the idea of offering vegetarian food to Krishna and to yes. make it prasada. So I think that was a very signal contribution that uh, Srila Prabhupada has made uh, amongst his many other contributions. Yes, ma'am. I just did some research, so there's some statistics that more than 200 million people are killed for food around the world every day just on land 200 animals you mean 200 million animals are killed are killed every day so mm -hmm. that works out to be now if you include even the fish that are killed then it goes much much more so what you said about the scale it is shocking Sometimes people have this argument that if humans don't eat meat, then the animal population will overgrow the earth. But there could yeah. be nothing further from the truth. I saw a visual where uh, there is that if we consider all the animals that are there on the in the earth right now, naturally living, they would be like a small uh, mustard seed, and the animals yeah. that are grown in a factory farm would be like a in the factory farm would be like a boulder. So it's it's a uh, huge yes. i think it was john lennon who said that if the animals formed a religion and uh, they were to depict de the devil they would depict the devil in the human form <laughs> yeah yeah so. i think uh, somehow the other this um, idea that we have the right to enjoy the earth and exploit the resources of the earth, be it animate or inanimate. Mm. You know, plants and trees or, uh, or be it animals and fish and so on. Uh, that is essentially at the root of, of this kind of a, a feeling where we feel a sense of entitlement. Yes. That the earth is ours to exploit because we are the mighty, ones here that is true and and as it goes on and progressively i think what has happened is a lack of godliness a lack of understanding of of the uh, spiritual essence of religions hmm. you know because religion has at its core its spiritual essence and then there are so many other things around it Yes. You know, people forget the spiritual essence of the religions and just get caught up with the other things around it, then we have a problem. So, therefore, Srila Prabhupada used to say that, you know, Jesus Christ said, Thou shalt not kill. I've mm. been hearing lectures of Prabhupada, you know, when I take That's lunch. True, yes. 
And it's amazing in these conversations how he brings up this point again and again, so many times. That thou shalt not kill. And now you have translated that as being thou shalt not murder, which means that you're only saying killing humans is prohibited, but killing mm. animals is all right. So he never lost the opportunity to bring up this point that, you know, we, we have to, for a civilized society, stop this organized mass slaughter of uh, animals. Yes, but so the figure you said is, is astounding. 200 million animals killed every single day. It's just mind boggling. Yeah, um, and this is not, it is not going uh, unnoticed by Mother Nature. Hmm. And it's not going to come free. It's not going to come without its uh, heavy cost. It's not going to come without retribution or reactions from nature. No, That's violence true. begets violence, pain begets pain, cruelty begets cruelty. And it's going to come back to us in so many different ways. And that's what Srila Prabhupada said, right? That because we do mass killing in these organized slaughterhouses, so it comes back to us in the form of uh, uh, wars and uh, epidemics and pestilence and natural disasters. Mm. There's, there is a kind of a direct correlation. Although uh, in today's day and age, where we try to have empirically correlatable, you know, kind of event, a situation. We say, okay, what is the tangible evidence that this uh, earthquake or this pestilence is directly caused by such and such act? You know, sometimes it may be possible to establish such a causal relationship, and sometimes it may not be possible to directly establish it. Mm. But Prabhupada pointed out that. Um, these things cannot go unanswered, you know. Yeah. So when things go on such a humongous scale like this, and see, even in a country like India, you know, I remember some months ago, I, I, I checked up uh, on vegetarianism. Do you know the statistics, how much of the world's population, human population is vegetarian? Oh, no, I haven't checked that. It's not it's a, a very large a number. Big. It's about 8%. Oh, really? Just and eight. That eight, yes. And that eight also includes what they call semi vegetarians. So I don't know oh. what that means. Perhaps okay. they, people. Yeah, some people it. say that they can take fish food, but not, uh, not okay. other animals. Yeah. They have that idea. Okay. And I guess most of them, at least till some years ago, were in India. Right? But even in India now, um, the number of non-vegetarians is increasing mm -hmm. rapidly. Yeah, and it's in, it's ironic that uh, sorry, that in the West, becoming a vegetarian or vegan is considered cool. But in yes. India, even now, becoming a non-vegetarian is considered to be modern, progressive, breaking off the shackles of tradition. So that's the yeah. way it's portrayed. Yes, yes. And... Because some celebrities are taking to veganism, it's also becoming cool now to become a vegan. Yes, I think that so has just happened in the last, maybe you could say, uh, last couple of years, the last few years. Yes. It started yes. happening. Right, so, right. So going back to the point about religion, you know, from what I understood, veganism was a, also a reaction to the uh, prevailing, prevailing worldview. So there was uh, within now some now Christianity itself is a very uh, big religion with many different worldviews within that espoused by different schools. But there is one school of thought which holds that uh, Christianity itself desacralized nature because their idea is that God exists beyond this world and souls are present only within the in, within humans. In fact, uh, the Abrahamic religions in general, they, they don't have an innate understanding of spirituality being all being pervasive. That, that the, the soul 
who can be redeemed is the souls who can be redeemed are primarily human human souls if we may use that word and so there was to some extent the idea the flora and fauna are just a backdrop for the central human drama of redemption through religion through yes so yes. now that ethos where there was the idea that the nature is just meant for our use that got further aggravated by industrialization so at least when the when the religious world view was prominent then okay then the world is for our use but this world is not our home ultimately so we have to devote ourselves to god and go beyond this world by his grace but as uh, the scientific world view spread skepticism about any other world increased so the human endeavor became that there is no such paradise in another world we have to create paradise here itself and then we already had a desacralized view of nature and then if we had developed technological resources to exploit nature and so in this case of animal farming if animals are meant to be consumed then why go through all the trouble of uh, finding them and shooting them or slaughtering them and catching them just to grow them and slaughter them and not just in a small way in a huge way so it was almost like a one two blow you can call it a, a double whammy or something like that a desacralized yes. view of nature and an increased power to subordinate nature to human will so yes so that those two things they came up and yeah oh, any thoughts about this yeah i think uh, interestingly it's it's just a coincidence that i'm writing an article exactly on on something like oh, this oh okay right now uh, i think the word for what you're mentioning what you just described very nicely right now i think the word for that would be anthropocentric you yes know, that's anthropocentric, true anthropocentric anthropos referring to humans so it's a human centered world hmm. a, a world of human exceptionalism where uh, humanity uh, has developed a certain arrogant world view where it believes that it is the most important part of this creation it is a very purpose of this creation and that everything else in the creation is meant to be subservient to its whims and its needs and is meant for its exploitation and enjoyment so the resources of nature as i was mentioning earlier according to this viewpoint would be um uh, whether animate or inanimate act should be at the disposal of humans mm. and when you have such a philosophy uh, that's uh, that's propelling you forward then that makes the most cruel things seem ethically unobjectionable yes if you say that the animals don't have a soul uh, then you're not killing something that is conscious and also when you say that it's it's meant to be like that it's meant to be that everything else is meant for human beings to enjoy so uh, humans become like the um the mighty uh, lord of the earth the might is right and this is mine to enjoy mm. so this kind of uh, a theology uh, you know that is underlying a theological understanding that underlies uh, the aggressive approach towards nature was i think reaching its peak by that time by the 1940s and 50s and so on Mm. and it was still growing it didn't still catch up till uh, quite a few decades later i think veganism even in the west uh, probably it must have started really catching on not more than 20 30 years ago am i right i think oh yes definitely it's just I don't think it was last... such a big word yeah i think uh, two three things uh, which really triggered this was that overall the scale of violence that was being done that started coming out to people's eyes 
there are organizations like peta they made videos like meet your meet and when that started coming out that really jolted people i have always wondered about this cognitive dissonance almost in westernized society that there is so much love for pets so dogs and cats uh, it's they're treated as more than family members like beloved children yes yes and at the same time there is such indiscriminate uh, slaughter of animals yes yes so i used to wonder how this happens so one factor i have understood is that it was concealed yes it is that the sheer um, the scale of violence was concealed and yes. once it started coming becoming apparent a lot of thoughtful people said i don't want to be a part of this yes yes so, i mean there have been thinkers um in the western uh, world also who have uh, considered eating meat abhorrent yeah i mean what comes to mind immediately say george bernard shaw he was famously said at one time that i'm a vegetarian because i don't want to make my stomach a graveyard a graveyard yeah that's true and then coming to the 60s and 70s or maybe a little later you had the beatle singer paul mccartney i think it was him saying that if slaughter houses had glass walls then everybody would become a vegetarian yes that's true that's a so from the time of um, uh, george bernard shaw to mccartney if you, if you see the difference there weren't organized slaughter houses on this scale at the time of george bernard shaw mm. he had a principal objection to killing any animal okay and the fact that you he didn't want to make his stomach a graveyard so that was an in principle uh, objection even at that scale but for paul mccartney is the, there's an added dimension to it and the dimension was that in these um, in those 70 or 80 years which must have elapsed between the two these organized slaughter houses had come into vogue so then mccartney and, and others like him were able to see that this yeah. is really getting out of hand it's just too much this humongous cruelty here Hmm. Yes. And and therefore, it is around this time that uh, the counterculture, so to speak, began. Yeah, the sixties, seventies, and and that gave birth to organizations like PETA and many others like that. And they strengthened the vegan movement, which started in the forties, fifties, sixties. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, relatively speaking, we could say the Vedic worldview. is much more supportive of caring for animals definitely definitely mm. yes so now one question that comes up is is this care actually reflected in indian society and this is i think we are moving to the second topic of where veganism diverges so their concern is that religion one concern among many is that if you have a religious motive for caring for animals then it becomes selective to which religion which animals are considered sacred by your religion so so if say in the abrahamic religions there was no religious motive specifically for caring for animals and then there's indiscriminate slaughter in certain other religions some animals may be cared for but those animals are venerated and other animals are just uh, completely they are neglected and they are abused and they just left to die so uh, is there a, to in practice uh, how much is the spiritual vision that all living beings have souls does it lead to an ethos of caring for animals in general yeah i think it does but in india specifically uh, i think what has happened is because of the degradation uh, in society in general in values mm. and because of the deterioration in the spiritual culture and the lack of uh, teaching and the the heavy um, shall we say forays that materialism made 
into India mm. uh, through colonization, through the industrialization, through uh, modern science and technology and all of these things. Uh, gradually, uh, the, the Vedic culture of sensitivity to, to animals and to all life forms, the Vedic understanding of the divinity of the world around us, you know, that got compromised, it got weakened. So even till a few decades ago, let us say, it was quite common to find uh, people, vegetarianism being very much more prevalent than it was today. Mm. Uh, today, over the years, especially the last several decades, it became quite fashionable in India to, or cool to be, become non-vegetarians. And to think that those who were vegetarians were backward or they were you know, old-fashioned or something like that. Um, yeah. But prior to that, the culture was very strong that they would feed animals, they would feed birds. You know, they would keep aside a portion of the food cooked at home to feed the animals and the birds. You know, so this was a prevalent culture. So along with the fact that the proportion of vegetarians was very significant in India mm. compared to what it is today, and that the culture of spirituality and of compassion for all living entities was still pretty much there, uh, yes. we could see that... Uh, uh, this kind of big slaughterhouses hadn't come in. There was killing of animals, certainly. There were non-vegetarians, so, you know, for a long, long time. Mm. Uh, but I don't think the organized slaughterhouses started till, you know, just um, maybe five or six decades ago. I could be wrong, but roughly yes. thereabouts. Yeah, so it true. is because I, I, I would directly attribute it to the decline of spiritual culture. Yes. The lack of awareness amongst people in general. And similarly, in the Western countries, the, the decline of godliness and the decline of understanding of the spiritual essence of their own religions mm. and the rise of materialism, you know, fueled by um, various other modern dogmas like atheism and so on. Mm. That's true. No. Although India has become significantly westernized, I have still not seen the vegan movement spread much in India. And as compared to the West, it is there, but it is not that influential. And I was looking at uh, the reasons for it. So one reason is ideological, that somehow there has been a strong uh, anti-Brahminical uh, leftist uh, ideological uh, surge and often vegetarianism is portrayed as a, a brahminical activity and that's why there are some groups who have something like beef eating parties and uh, other things like that where they consider uh, becoming a non-vegetarian as a statement of rejection of what they call as brahminical authority of Brahminical auto autocracy, which they said led to the caste system. So there are a lot of complex ideological tensions over there. Yes, yes. Actually, there are two different kinds. Th these are two groups, one would say. One, as you said, are those who are driven by a certain kind of ideology that you've described. And because uh, the Brahminical culture uh, promoted vegetarianism and mm. because uh, there were undeniably injustices of various sorts perpetrated on many people mm. so this was a kind of way of getting back you know a retribution of sorts for the injustices meted out to them uh, in history and so deliberately going for beef eating parties or or um, slandering uh, the Brahminical culture and the whole concept of vegetarianism, etc., became uh, in, came into vogue, basically, mm. uh, over the last uh, maybe five or six decades in India. And also, it was cool for another section of people who were trying to imitate the West, who were influenced by the West heavily, 
because of the modern educational system in India being heavily dominated by a Western approach. Yeah. The Indian educational approach or the traditional Vedic approach, so to speak, having somewhat kind of uh, receded into the background. So these people who were influenced by the West, they started moving from vegetarianism to non-vegetarianism. Mm. So you have these two classes of people moving from vegetarianism to non-vegetarianism. One who moved into okay. this kind of leftist That's space, the other moved into the Western liberal space. And they moved in. And uh, you mentioned earlier that the veganism hasn't caught on much in India. That's a fact. It's true. Uh, but if you also notice, uh, India uh, in copying the West is always a few decades behind. Yes, exactly. Yes. So the fads and fashions of, of the West usually take a few years uh, till they become well rooted in India. So uh, now already a few celebrities uh, have become vegan. So, you know, they, they're probably early, they were non-vegetarian, but they went straight to vegan. <laughs> it's not yeah. that they were vegetarian yeah. and then became vegan. So they made that plunge probably because they were influenced by uh, the teachings of, of the proponents of veganism. Uh, yes, that's so, true. Uh, an interesting thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, uh, one time I was reading a newspaper article and there were letters and this uh, one lady had written an article or a letter, I don't remember now, in which she said that when she went abroad one time, she was asked by uh, her host that, oh, I don't think you'll be eating beef, right? You're from India. So she took offense to that and she was writing in the letter that I'm tired of people thinking that I am vegetarian because I come from India. And uh, this is the Californification Californi Californi of India, California, because it's, you know, maybe she had gone to California or whatever. So that's how now people are thinking that, uh, you, know, we have, uh, you know, we don't eat beef and all that. But my immediate response when I read that was the Cali Californification of, of uh, India began when you started eating beef in the first place. You know, it, it was oh, the, your grandparents yeah. never ate beef. That's true. So you started eating beef hmm. you know, and because the Westerners were eating it and that's what it was a cool thing to do. It was in vogue to start eating beef. So you started eating beef. And now because this, the vegan philosophy is coming in from outside mm. and condemning it as, you know, the Californization of India or the Americanization of India, forgetting that you're starting to eat beef in the first place was because of that. Mm, yeah, that's, that's quite striking. Uh, it's uh, that the the progressive, we could say the spiritually progressive trends from the West do take some time to catch up. Among the various trends, we could say the environmental consciousness, veganism, yoga, mindfulness. I think the one that has relatively caught up is to some extent is yoga. Because some prominent Indian leaders have championed yoga. The matter of, say, International Yoga Day has become a matter of national pride. So I don't really know how many people have vigorously started practicing yoga because of that. But at least uh, that has caught up from the West. It has now started coming to India. But we have not had that many celebrity champions of veganism. The people may adopt it, but to publicly champion it and... I think one difference between yoga and vegetarianism is that yoga involves just adding something to your life. But veganism involves removing something from your life. Mm. Okay, There's a food that I'm going to eat and I have to give it up. So the yeah. cost is a bit more. And yeah. in that sense, people may object, people may not want to endorse it publicly. Now, even in this, uh, Al Gore had made that movie, The Inconvenient Truth. 
about mm-hmm. the environmental crisis he he did not go into the direction of how non vegetarian food is causing the environmental crisis although there is a major uh, a shift to vegetarianism could be one of the uh, financially speaking cheapest way to uh, address the environmental crisis he avoided that so i think that the personal cost in terms of uh, the sacrifice or loss of certain pleasures that makes this seem to be a intrusive to our territory that people don't want to tread on yes because there's a vested interest here um also i think as far as india is concerned because yoga is something home grown okay. it's it here it was there's already a culture although it has declined but it's there is everybody knows about it even though not so many people actually do it but people know about it whereas the vegan concept is a little alien vegetarianism is home grown very much okay but vegan the idea of giving up let's say milk and dairy products is rather alien and strange to a country which reveres the cow as mother and it glorifies the cow for all its products and its utility and value for the human race and where you have a yoga therapy and ayurveda which also focus a lot on milk and milk products so this is kind of uh, something alien mm. so this has caught on more with people who were kind of influenced a, a, a bit more by the uh, western mode of thinking but also uh, because they they realized that there was some substance to what the vegans were saying as we also do that the the uh, non vegetarian eating of non vegetarian food became tainted with such enormous cruelty that you know they saw that that what the vegans were saying was correct mm. so there is that aspect to it also so okay. i think that has contributed to a few of the, few people taking up veganism in india and i think uh, from what i see is growing a few yeah. celebrities have kind of publicly stated that they have become vegans and it will grow i think that's my feeling so you you stated the key differences between veganism and vegetarianism so one i i think the major would center on for uh, from an indian perspective would be on a uh, cow and taking milk and uh, other cow products are there any other places where maybe you could list what you feel are the major differences between uh, veganism and vegetarianism as was traditionally practiced in india with a spiritual understanding or we could say the bhakti perspective and veg- veganism which are the major separating diverging points hmm. actually i think veganism is a philosophy that objects strongly to the usage of any animal products products of an animal origin because they believe that fundamentally doing so involves exploitation and cruelty so from what i understand this is the core or the essence of the philosophy of veganism and therefore uh they they avoid eating meat fish etc eggs and in that we are totally with them so this is where we agree heartily with them that we don't eat fish meat eggs etc um but they go a couple of steps further because they say it's not only in respect of food but also in respects of clothes and respects of personal artifacts and belongings and anything of of uh, human use you know should be avoided because of animal origin so basically what does that mean the first thing apart from meat fish and eggs that the vegans avoid is milk and milk derivatives hmm so that's butter yogurt cheese you know lassi and and so on and so forth and that's something that uh, 
is so deeply steeped in Indian cuisine and Indian culture and Indian philosophy, Indian spirituality even, there is hard to accept this as a principle. But we'll come to the point of where we understand where they're coming from. It's because of the cruelty involved in extracting milk nowadays. So we agree with them over there but not with the fundamental principle that because it's an animal product, you know, it's necessarily uh, a source of, uh, a cause of exploitation and cruelty. If indeed there is cruelty and exploitation in, in drawing milk from the cow, then we don't want that. So yeah. we agree with them on that point. But traditionally in India, for so many millennia, the uh, uh, cows were looked after you know, very lovingly with great devotion. Lord Krishna set the standard in Vindavan as the original transcendental cowherd boy. So anyway, that's the first point where vegans, uh, where we differ from vegans because they don't eat milk and milk derivatives. Hmm. Second thing is uh, honey. Yes. They, we, we take honey, they don't take honey. Again, there's a similar principle there because they feel that extracting honey uh, involves cruelty and exploitation of the bees. In as much as milk is important for us civilizationally, spiritually, culturally, honey is also important. You know, if you look at our deity worship, you know, the Panchamrita Abhishek, the five nectars with which we bathe the deities, right? We have, of course, milk, we have yogurt and we have ghee. And then we have sugar water and we have honey. Mm. Honey is one of the five items with which the deities are bathed at the time of the Abhishek ceremony. Uh, honey is offered, I think it's in Hari Bhakti Vilas or somewhere, I can't cite the exact reference now, but Sanatana Goswami mentions that if you offer honey to the lotus feet of the Lord, you know, the Lord is very pleased and it's far greater than so many thousands of Rajasu Yayagyas or something like that. So uh, you also have honey in the Madhu Parka, which is offered to the Lord. So in various types of worship and even in receiving guests, honey was very much used in our spiritual and religious practices. And even in uh, Ayurveda, you know, it is such an important uh, means of therapy is used for its medicinal value as, as a standalone um, medicinal item, apart from sometimes acting as a vehicle for other medicines because it's sweet. Mm. So if you want to take a bitter medicine or something, then you can use honey or in combination with that bitter medicine, perhaps it's more effective. So I, from the point of view of, of worship, from the point of view of Ayurveda, even the yogis, they had milk and uh, honey. Even today you say it's a land of milk and honey, right? <laughs> Where you want to say that it's, everything is in abundance. And, mm. and milk and honey are two of the best sattvic foods according to uh, Vedic uh, philosophy. In principle, so even though the uh, honey comes from bees and so on, and, uh, but still somehow it, it's, it's sattvic because a food is considered um, sattvic according to the kind of effect that it has on the one who consumes it. It's known as sattvic or rajasic or tamasic, you know, in the mode of goodness or passion or the, and ignorance according to the kind of qualities and properties it has. Mm. So honey has a kind of a property that um, invokes a, or in the sense of good, good, a mode of goodness in people. Yeah. So honey is the second part, right? So there's milk, there's honey. As far as food items, I think, as far as I can see, these are the only two main differences. And perhaps some other things like, you know, gelatin capsules and other things which have animal products, you know? Yeah, I think wool might also be a concern. Woolen clothes. Yes. Even wool. if you go to clothing, it's quite a bit. Other yes. things. Yeah. Absolutely. Wool and silk. 
silk yeah and woolen silk these are also two interesting items that vegans don't use whereas we have a different take on that yeah the perspective so now i have been thinking about this that you know at one level at a intuitive moral level it does seem right you know animals are not for our use if we don't approach it from a perspective of a particular culture that animals are not for our use in fact the word use itself jars a thoughtful human being no no other human being is for meant to be used by any other human being and no other living being is meant to be used uh, however while we agree with that we don't want to use other living beings but nature itself doesn't exist in isolated compartments so there is interaction and uh, we see that there are various modes of relationships among natural in the natural world itself there is of course predators and prey but then there are there are symbiotic relationships so there are various modes and we cannot we cannot uh, isolate humanity from the rest of nature one way we try to isolate it so we could if we consider a pendulum so in some ways we had isolated humanity at one extreme is we are above all of nature and we will dominate nature so now maybe the pendulum has swung to the other way in veganism and it says you know that we are separate from nature and we, we won't take anything especially specifically here from the animal world so Mm. You are you have become muted somehow. I don't okay. know what happened. It, it suddenly oh yeah went off. But I think it's overall that it's continuing recording. Okay. So so from a, a rational or a moral perspective, uh, without if we start with whenever I try to speak with uh, new people, I try to. approach with a minimalist assumption approach that means if somebody doesn't have to assume that this thing is right or this thing is right or this thing is right so if say i don't consider cows to be sacred but uh, still or i don't consider milk to be special as compared to other products so from a rational perspective or even from a moral something which feels right so one approach i thought is that nature exhibits multiple relationships within each other within various living beings and we humans could also have a have multiple modes of interaction so certainly we don't want domination and exploitation of the animal world but just taking some animal products does that necessarily lead to exploitation so yeah any thoughts about that this is precisely the point i think the vegans are going too far yes i mean up to a point we are right there with them totally in tune with them but beyond the point then i i feel they go too far and i think you you said it very nicely that it's not it's not one or the other it's not that you either you have a, a feeling of exploiting everything and that if you don't want to exploit then you can't use anything mm. that is possible uh instead of using i would say uh, uh there is harmonious interdependence yes in no species no race no individual can exist independently in this world right we are dependent on a million other categories animate and inanimate we are dependent on the bacteria in the soil without which we wouldn't have any crops no plants would grow if it wasn't for the microbes in the soil if it wasn't for the microbes and bacteria in the in our gut in our intestines we wouldn't be able to digest the food and so many crucial functions are performed by little insects by germs by birds who pollinate the bees who also help in pollination so it's all one very complex inconceivable networking 
of harmonious interdependence. No one can say that uh, I will not use anything else. Then you won't be able to survive. Mm. But what we do say is that don't be cruel. Don't exploit. You cannot live without using something, quote unquote. But use it according to certain criteria. So I would list out the following criteria that we would keep in mind to regulate this principle of using something from our environment. Okay? Hmm. What, what would be the guiding factors that would uh, dictate whether and to what degree we can use something from nature, whether it's hmm. an animal product or not, whether it's a vegetable product or not. I mean, for the matter, it's not just that we have, uh, uh, there are problems with animal products, there are problems with plant products as well. We could uh, indiscriminately cut trees, we could do so many other things and, and exploit mm. plant resources as well. So I would say that whether it's plant-based or animal-based or animate or inanimate, the following criteria can be kept in mind to guide our decisions on what we can use for our benefit and to what degree. Hmm. Number one, I would say that that particular use should be recommended in our scriptures or at least permitted or at the very least not prohibited in the scriptures. Hmm. First point. If that first point is, is okay, if that's fulfilled, then we go to the next, that we should not use it with cruelty. We should not inflict pain and cruelty uh, upon whatever it is. It may be a tree, a plant, an animal, or an insect, whatever it may be. <clears throat> Even a mountain, a river, anything. So that's second. <clears throat> uh, the third, and by the way, we can be cruel to inanimate things also, even though they can't um, perhaps feel like we do. But by cruelty, I mean a form of exploitation and unjust uh, assault, uh, you know, on, on other entities. So that's the second point, which is that there must be no cruelty and inflicting of pain and unnecessary assault on the category which we propose to use. Hmm. The third, not only should there be no cruelty and, and pain inflicted on that category, on, in fact, we must have love and devotion to it. We must love everything in nature. Of course, our understanding is, and I'll come to this a little later at the end, uh, but if you love Krishna, you love everything else. Mm. Okay. But still, uh, we must love everything that we do. So we love the cows. When you love the cows, you serve them with love and devotion as Krishna did in Vrindavan, then you can't be cruel to them. If you are cruel to the cows, it means that you haven't understood what Krishna's system was. You haven't, you haven't got this point right that these cows are not to be exploited and not to be cruelly treated. So we must offer with love and devotion. We serve them. And even if they're, let's say, bees, you know, <laughs> now you can't love a bee like you can love a cow, right? In a cow, you can actually have a reciprocal relationship. You love and stroke the cow, the cow licks you, and there is a very tangible reciprocal relationship of love that is perceived. But with a bee, you can't have that. <laughs> or, you know, but you can still uh, do it in a way that in your heart, there is an understanding that this bee is also an agent of Krishna. Mm. You know, and, and we can also deal with the bee in a way that doesn't cause it pain, that doesn't deprive it of its nutrients, of its life, and so on. So there is a kind of an inner feeling of compassion, of love. So that's the third point, love. I would say, 
The fourth point would be that whatever we use, we should use in moderation. So that's about the quantity. Because even if you have a sattvic food, let's say milk, but if you drink too much milk, <laughs> you're going to have a, a problem. Mm. So you can't justify excessive consumption of milk on the grounds that it is sattvic. So sattvic not only uh, identifies certain kinds of foodstuffs, but it also indicates that these things must be light, easy to digest, and therefore must be partaken of in moderation only, not in excessive quantity. So therefore, that's the fourth point, that it should be done in moderation. And finally, I would say, after all of these things are done, then it should be offered to Lord Krishna with love before we use it. So whether it's milk, or it's honey, or it's food grains, or it is a new cloth that we have got, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we will, uh, in fact, the Shastras even talk of medicine. We have to all offer it to Krishna with love and then consume it as prasadam. So I would say these are the five criteria on the basis of which we can utilize what Krishna or God has provided to us in the environment. If we have these five guiding principles <clears throat> or these five criteria in mind, then I don't think that it is uh, wrong in any way to utilize things from the uh, environment. That's beautiful. This is very well thought out. I'll repeat this. Scripturally authorized, cruelty-free, uh, with loving attitude, then uh, in, moderation. in moderation, and then offer to the offer to Krishna. Yes, yes. Okay. That's... Now, all five have to be there. Yes, that's true. So, with respect to the second point of cruelty free. Mm -hmm. Say, there is a traditional argument that cows give more milk than what their cows need. And in that sense, cows have been designed by nature to provide milk to humans. Now, the counter argument that, say, the vegans have is that we don't see that in nature. Quite often, you have to restrain and deprive the calf. Uh, so, and only then you can get the milk for humans <coughs> and also that <clears throat> when we, when we as humans, uh, when we grow up and we take milk, now other species, most species take milk during their, their weaning species and they're in infancy, but uh, we don't, but only humans take milk later on. So the, beyond that, we can address the specifics, but beyond that, uh, there is this basic principle that whatever is done in nature, that is the way we should be doing things. So that premise itself is everything natural, by natural means, how is it is done in nature, is everything natural the way humans should be doing it just because <clears throat> natural that doesn't necessarily make it desirable or uh, necessary and mandatory for us so could you comment on these two perspective perspectives about it I'll come to the second one first you know what we can use from nature what we can't etc is not up to us to freely decide independently. That's one of the five criteria. The first one was mm. it must be scripturally authorized. Okay. So what I can, what is meant for a human being and what is not meant for a human being? What is nature's arrangement for the human being? What's nature's arrangement for the tiger or for the bee? Is not something I can simply decide on my own. 
I have to see the larger scheme of things as ordained by the supreme authority. Mm. Now, the problem comes in when environmental activism comes to devoid of God consciousness. Mm. So, you have Mother Nature, but you don't have Father God. So, you, you try to struggle to protect Mother Nature, which is noble, which is good. But unless you do it under the guidance of Father God, you know, you will have a problem. You know, because your, your environmental activism and your protection of the environment will be incomplete. Mm. So, whether a human being should drink milk uh, in adulthood or not, considering that all other species drink milk only in their infancy, in their childhood, and only humans are the ones who drink later. Now, is that natural for humans or not? Who decides? So mm. we have the Shastra. And the Shastra describes the cow's milk as being the, one of the most sattvic foods that are best for developing the uh, health, the physical health of the body for humans and also for developing the finer tissues of the brain, as Srila Prabhupada puts it, and to develop a kind of a spiritual inclination, to live a happy and wise life. So, therefore, decisions about these things must be seen with reference to God's plan for us in this world. And therefore, when you divorce God from your picture of the uh, um, environmental protection, all conundrums come up. So if we bring in a plan for us and we accept that this is how it is, then things become much simpler. So coming to the first point, I think about uh, the calf, right? The cruelty oh, when the yeah. calf is deprived of its rightful just share just of... One minute before, I, if I can just respond to this point a little bit. See, as soon as we start talking about God and God's plan, at least today's mind takes it as, you know, it's your religion, your <clears throat> God's interpretation of things. So quite often people have to take certain leaps of faith to accept that this is God's plan for humanity. Because even within religions, we see that not all religions uh, mandate or stress vegetarianism with an equal emphasis. So... This, of course, could lead us to a separate discussion in future about, you know, could we arrive at a, at a universal basic understanding of what being spiritual or being God-centered could mean? But at this stage, when we talk about the plan that God has, that how, what all can be taken from nature and what all can be not taken from nature? We could, if we just approach it from a rational perspective, then we could say that there are so many things in human society that we don't do, that we humans wear clothes. And that's a sign of human culture. Now, in humans, we have, uh, we have pair bonding in the form of marriages. And in some ways, it's essential because the human offspring requires far more care than other any other species so other species they, the the offspring can just you know, for example bird that egg or egg fish and fish babies they might just be able to live on their own right from the beginning so there are significant differences between human society and the animal world and many of these have actually ensured the survival and the flourishing of human society. So is it, even if I don't bring in a religious angle to it, <clears throat> even I think from a rational perspective, we could make a case that uh, the animal world and how things are done in the animal world need not be a benchmark or model for how human society has to function. Yeah, good point. You know what I would say in this regard? I would think it would be a good idea to introduce the concept of the three modes of material nature. 
Okay. And tell them how we are all guided and governed by these three modes. Hmm. And they make us act and think differently. And why it is important for us to be governed by a particular mode, let's say the mode of goodness. Hmm. And what are the characteristics and consequences of being in the mode of goodness? And similarly for the mode of passion and ignorance. If that is presented in a very scientific, in a rational, in a logical manner, it is there for everyone to see. If one gives sufficient examples, etc., from the world around us, then people will get it. And then we say, okay, so now let's examine different foodstuffs from the point of view of the kind of effects they have on people. Hmm. You know, so let's talk about foodstuffs. So even if you bring them to Bhagavad Gita, but tell them, okay, if, even if you don't accept Krishna as God, at least, at least accept some of these principles here. Your theological beliefs will come to later, you know. Once they develop faith in the three modes of material nature and many other things that are mentioned there, they will slowly start developing faith that, yeah, the person who's speaking this must be really great because he's speaking something that's so rational and so wonderful. And they will develop faith in Krishna automatically. So then we talk about the effects that drinking milk can have. By milk, I mean not the modern milk from the industrial farming, dairy farming, but mm. the original pure milk, uh, you know, with a calf cottage share and everything else, mm. cruelty free. Um, then they will understand that yes, it's meant for us. That's number one. Number two, we can talk of history in terms of traditions. You look at all the great yogis and renunciants and others who lived on very frugal diets. Many of them lived in isolation in the forests or in the hills and they ate roots and berries and fruits and there were some who lived exclusively even on milk. Right? Mm. And they managed to sustain their bodies and remain very healthy throughout their life just by drinking milk. And because of that, they had such a pure consciousness. And because of that, they were then able to pursue their spiritual activities properly. So even if people don't believe in the concept of a personal God, if they think that's a sectarian idea, etc., at least they can understand logically the concept of the three modes of nature and they can also understand that there is something spiritual there is a spiritual process there is a world of spirituality and there is a, a, a group of people in history who have traditionally been following this kind of life what are the kinds of foods they ate yes just look at that so in this way i think we can we can uh, bring out bring to them uh, no, bring to their notice reasonable hmm, that's that's beautiful so we there is a there is a what is called as metaphysical or philosophical spirituality and there is also pragmatic or functional spirituality and functional uh, pragmatic spirituality is where if at an empirical level the benefits of uh, certain spiritual practices are explained then that that can be adopted even if i still don't accept or have some reservations about the metaphysical claims of that particular uh, world view or that particular spirituality so i find that the empirical empirical spirituality can act as a good bridge so that people don't people don't have to take a leap of faith they have a bridge by which they can walk across toward that faith so it's a so three modes is a is a fascinating topic and maybe we could uh, discuss it again in future of what it means but yes yeah. in terms of uh, three modes as well as traditional is there's some internet issue oh Okay, now uh, is it your, is it at your end or my end? Is my internet weak or your <laughs> internet? Oh, okay. But it's has it stopped now or is it still there? 
lost you for a few seconds. Uh, I'm uh, I got overall. Now you're back to, I can see you again now. Okay. Okay, mm. so if I understood you right, you think that there are two approaches. One is the um, metaphysical theological approach. And the other is one that gives a pragmatic uh, presentation of the th philosophy and theology in such a way that is empirically verifiable. Uh, yes, uh, that's, that's the approach I'm speaking of as a second uh, option. But uh, in doing so, you also present a model. Yes. It's very much a part of the the philosophy, like the three modes of material nature, the whole concept of it, hmm. you know. So it will make them realize that what we're saying is really quite reasonable. That's true. Right? That's true, yes. yes you had also true. mentioned the first point was about the, the calf not getting the milk. Yes, that's true. And that's something that's at the heart of the, the whole problem, you know. Um, and I agree with the vegans here because today the industrial dairy farming um, has, has become so full of cruelty, uh, the less said the better. It's, it's unspeakable, the, the things that they do. So I would say that uh, the criteria for us to accept milk uh, should be as follows, and these were all followed in the earlier days in, you know, in India and other places as well, uh, most places at least. Hmm. Um, the first and most important criterion is at the very minimum, don't kill the cows and the bulls and the calves. Okay. Okay, at the very least. Second, um, look after the cows and bulls with love and devotion hmm. okay third uh, don't um, feed or inject into the cows or the bulls uh, various types of chemical substances and hormones and uh, what else so, you know antibiotic unnecessary antibiotics and so on just to boost your uh, production of milk mm. it is very harmful to the cows and, you know and the calves fourth uh, do not confine them to the stalls all day and all night long you know let them graze freely in the pasture lands in the forest or at least in some courtyards and you know mm. they should have access to grazing land as far as possible but let them not be exclusively confined because that's also a form of cruelty. The next point would be a uh, very, very important point. Uh, don't separate the calf and the mother. Okay. And the, the cow becomes very joyful when the calf is with her and the calf feels very sheltered and protected when it's with the mother hmm. and so the cow gives milk profusely when she is in a cheerful mood the other day i was hearing Srila Prabhupada's lecture and he was saying that you want to artificially extract milk from the cow by injecting and by doing so many other nasty things but if you just keep the cow happy and joyful out of sheer pleasure the cow will give abundant milk there will not be any shortage. So when the mother cow is with her calf, she feels so happy. And if she's overall well looked after by the cow herds, with care, with devotion, and you know they're allowed to graze, they're fed properly, etc., then they will give ample milk. And the first right of the milk, or to consume the milk, is with the calf. So the calf should get its rightful share of milk from the mother, and the calf should be allowed to drink to its full satisfaction. Even if it means that as a result of that, we as humans get a little less milk. So when the whole focus is on trying to extract 
as much milk as possible from the mm. cow. When you look at the cow as a milk machine, then naturally cruelty comes in. But if you understand that the first right to the milk of the cow is, to, is, is given to the calf, then the excess milk can be taken by humans. And that is a fair thing for humans to do. So there are other things also in terms of cruelty, like you know, nowadays they have these artificial milking machines, which cause a lot of pain. And very often the pus and blood also comes into the milk from the udders. And they're practically on to be kept on the udders almost all day long, 24 hours if I'm not mistaken, in some cases. Uh, so in this way, there are any number of cruel practices which they, which they perform. I've just given a sample. Mm. But at least these principles must be followed very strictly. Then we can say that this kind of milk is totally acceptable. And if these criteria are fulfilled, then I believe that if the vegans still have objections to drinking milk, then that is not very reasonable. Yes. So we would differ with the vegans in this respect. Yes, that is true. I think there are not many, they may not uh, even have an experience of a culture like this where, where animals are cared for. So the, there is an animal ecosystem, we could say, and we humans are not interrupting it, but rather we are facilitating it. So if you say the cow and the calf are, never se are not separated from each other, then their natural ecosystem is going on. But then we are, so rather than we could say taking from the animal world, we are actually giving, we are facilitating. Yeah. And then that would be quite remarkable. Now I would like to, maybe if, if you would like, I believe that you have inspired the devotees in Melbourne to start a whole project, Mother Cow Dairy, where they are having uh, Australian farmers taking care of cows and we have Ahimsa milk coming up. Would you like to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it's a project that's quite uh, dear to my heart. It's um, very important. And that's one thing that Srila Prabhupada really wanted. He wanted us to have um, milk uh, of this sort. Now, you see, when we tell people that you must not drink the milk supplied in the supermarkets from the industrial dairy farms because of the cruelty and so on and so forth, and you must drink milk that is only cruelty-free, etc., etc., the question arises, where is such milk available? Mm. So, uh, one, one way out is to have our own farms, which Srila Prabhupada very much wanted. And indeed, many of our temples uh, worldwide do have farms. Uh, it's very challenging to run a farm, to maintain it, keep it financially viable. So many issues connected with that. But in Melbourne, in this project, the Mother Cow Derby, um, the effort is to try to make it a little easier in the sense that to not directly start a farm oneself and then bring on cows and bulls and get land and grow, you know, manage the whole rearing of the cows oneself, but to go to people who are already experienced in this, who already have their own land, who are experienced farmers for generations, who know this job, who know what it takes to uh, rear cows to feed them, etc. But when we approach these farmers, we go there with some conditions. And we say, well, look, you have, let's say, 200 cows and um, cows and bulls, etc. Now, we'll select a certain number of your herd, let's say 50 or 100, maybe even the entire 200. So if it's a group of 50, then we say these 50 should be looked after according to the terms and conditions that we lay out. Mm. 
which is basically all the points that I mentioned earlier, okay. that they should never be sent to a slaughterhouse. They should be looked after with love and devotion till their natural death. You know, the calf should never be deprived of the association of its mother and the mother's milk to it, you know? So all of these conditions. And if the farmer agrees, then naturally uh, he will see that it's going to cost a lot more. Because the way modern industrial dairy farming is set up, the economics works and the milk in the supermarkets is so cheap because uh, the farmers sell the bulls and the bull calves and also the cow that they to the house. And they make a lot of money from that. Mm. So therefore, the supermarkets are able to pressurize the farmers to sell milk at a very low price. And sometimes milk is even cheaper than water. You know, the good qualities of uh, oh. mineral water. The higher end, uh, top end mineral water can be uh, more expensive than milk. But it's an artificially suppressed price. It is being subsidized by the killing of the cows and the bulls and the calves. So we tell them that, yes, we are willing to pay you that subsidy. So we will pay you that extra amount. So it can come to as much as three to four times the cost of the milk. If it's available at, let's say, uh, $1 a liter or $2 a liter, whatever it is, let's say $1 a liter, just for argument's sake, then this milk would cost, let's say, $4 a liter. And we tell them, yes, we're willing to pay you $4 because that's actually the cost of the milk. This is and then, quite a, yeah. Uh, we market it and um, people who buy into this ideology of karma-free milk, exploitation-free, cruelty-free milk, etc., then they're willing to pay that extra amount to buy this milk. Yes. So the farmer is happy because he gets whatever he needs. He gets his reasonable profit margin. In fact, it's better than the margin he gets by selling to the slaughterhouses, uh, to the supermarkets. Oh. Uh, and he also feels satisfied that he's contributing to a good cause. Mm. And from our point of view, we have somebody who knows how to look after cows and bulls, who has land, who has the experience. And we are also reasonably assured that our cows and bulls are not going to be uh, sent to the slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. Of course, it also means that you have to oversee and monitor and ensure that things actually go on according to the terms agreed. Yes. So this is called Mother Cow Dairy. So there are a few devotees in Melbourne uh, who has the devotees who are really doing a magnificent job. They're struggling really hard and uh, they're facing so many challenges, but they're carrying on. Now they're distributing the milk in Sydney as well, and some devotees in Sydney are helping out to distribute. I think they also send it to Perth. Perth, yes. Although the cost rises even further because of the transportation. Mm -hmm. But it's a kind of a model which is replicable. If yeah. it can be done elsewhere, then here we have an option, you know, for not only devotees, but anyone else who is sensitive to this cause. Mm. And they have some milk available. Even in, in the UK, there is a devotee there who runs, manages this Ahimsa milk project. And many people buy that milk. Yeah. It's more expensive than the regular milk. Now what I found especially, thank you for sharing that. I found especially a uh, significant about the project in Melbourne is that uh, what you said that we were able to outsource it to others and so it's more not like we are we have to do it ourselves which is going to be difficult for us especially abroad unless we have already a farm community where we have to take care of cows and that is a whole huge project in itself but this is a smaller model where rather than we starting from scratch, if we inspire and uh, facilitate local people to do that, then 
we could even not just we are protecting our culture but maybe we are also sharing some of our values with them yes and this be sustainable so just uh, uh this could be so now if there are three different situations say if somebody has uh, the option to take ahimsa milk nearby hmm, then it may be more expensive and they have to they they have to that's worth the cost sell that's one option where we get cruelty free milk or ahimsa milk the other is that we don't get that milk so we take the normal milk and maybe we pray and offer it to krishna and then take it or the third is that we abstain from milk so now among these three say if the third option is there then naturally that would be the recommended one even if it is more expensive but there are places where the third is not available at all so i have been asked this question that then in that situation what do we do because at least for our temples if there's no farm nearby we need for the deities we need milk for the various worship from the worship and for offering the bhoga to the lord so among these two which one to choose at a individual level not at a institutional level so my answer usually is that you know in spiritual life there are principles and there are preferences so that that with respect to this particular area if some devotees if they don't get ahimsa free milk they may feel that yes, this is a part of our culture so let me take whatever is available let me offer it to krishna and through this because i'm offering it to krishna at least that cow will be benefited by it and it's not that my not drinking milk its slaughter is not necessarily going to stop so that could be one way of looking at it take it and spiritualize it at whatever level i can and the other is no i don't want to be any part of it i don't have any part of it so if uh, if we don't have ahimsa milk then for functional purposes in that situation we become like vegans so what would be your thoughts on the situation yeah this is a question i think we all get asked yeah everyone yeah. obviously as you said if ahimsa milk is available that is definitely the first choice mm. sometimes even when ahimsa milk is available some devotees feel they can't afford it mm. i would think that they should cut corners somewhere but maybe cut down the consumption of something else but take this now where i am some milk is not available you have the two choices mm. either to buy the regular supermarket milk available outside or to abstain from it altogether and as you said functionally for all functional purposes be like a vegan now my personal uh, what i feel is it is up to devotees to make their choice hmm there are two schools of thought within amongst the devotee in the devotee community one prefers one option the other says the other personally i would i would fall in the group where i abstain yeah from if it is not i am samilk uh i i avoid milk unless i'm fairly sure that the milk is coming from a place where there is no cruelty mm. uh, of course it's really difficult to 100% no in some cases but certainly in um, in some places you can have an idea that yes uh, it is fairly ahimsa the calf gets its share of the milk and so on so in such places i take milk so then i'm not a vegan but if if such milk is not available then i abstain that's my personal preference yes and i also try to do the same thing in yeah. general and then what about for the temple we'll have to go on with whatever is available isn't it i would say let the temples feel inspired to set up farm projects where they can look after the cows nicely and they can produce their own milk according to our principles 
Hmm. It's a challenge in so many respects. Uh, but Srila Prabhupada really wanted our temples to have farms. So if we do that, then probably temples will have such milk getting, being available to them, especially for the deities and so on. And for the devotees. That's true. So I think this is, this is an area that's a little tricky. Yeah. Uh, not for me, but in the sense that for, for me, I'm clear about it. Uh, but many devotees are, are caught between the two options. So I can just tell them, look, this is what I do. Now you choose yeah. what you would like to do. That's true. We just uh, to uh, go back to a slightly earlier point. So there is a, that because when, when say, any particular initiative is infused by a religious motivation or inspiration, it tends to become selective. So in, from a rational perspective, you know, how could we explain why there is so much veneration of cows? That in fact, in, the, in English, there is a phrase itself called holy cow. And that is, uh, that is used to signify any object of irrational veneration. So the idea that in Indian culture, cows are venerated, that is sometimes been caricatured. So one thing, of course, we know, and Prabhupada quoted quite often was that the cow gives us milk. And in that sense, the cow is like our mother. We take our mother milk, mother's milk and we take the cow's milk. So I also read that in some families, that uh, so, uh, the children would take the milk of only their cow. They would not even take milk from a neighbor's cow or some other cow because they had that personal bond. Just like I take my mother's breast milk, so a child would take a mother's breast milk, like that they would take milk from their own cow. So there was a whole culture in which the cow was a integral part of the family. So it is, uh, it is maybe a more of a personal emotional bond that has to be experienced without that it may seem a, it may seem quite difficult to understand just like maybe we indians sometimes find it difficult why people are in the west are so attached to their cow that their dogs or their cats so maybe it is to some extent cultural but are there any other ways in which this could be explained well i would say you know what is rational, what is not rational? You, if you cynically or in, to scorn, you say, holy cow, use that expression to indicate some veneration that is irrational in their opinion. Then today for the West, should you say, holy dog, holy cat? Because that's how you, that's how you revere and venerate your dogs and cats. Yeah. You have your pets at home. So is there anything rational about it? What is rational? What is not rational? So that's one thing. That's beautiful. I mean, if you want to yeah. Sorry? No, no. If you want to deconstruct rationality, even all relationships, even human relationships, what is rational about it? Yes. yes. It, no? Okay, you are in a relationship with this person, but it's not working. Just break it up. Yes. So yeah. We could we could we could disintegrate everything by uh, submitting it to an exclusively rational lens. That's a yes. very good point. Thank you. Yeah. And secondly, I would also give the same argument that you have given, which is the point that Srila Prabhupada made again and again, that the cow is like a mother, mm. and uh, because the mother gives you milk. You know, and the cow gives us milk. And indeed, our mother, biological mother, gives us milk only for a few years. Mm. But the cow gives us milk for the duration of our entire life. Mm. And in the absence of our mother's milk, the best milk is cow's milk. Even for us as children, as human children. Mm. So is it a question of rationality? 
that you should love your mother. You should be grateful for your mother. You know, so this whole concept of rationality and trying to reduce uh, humans to automatons where you try to make everything just rational. It doesn't work like that. Human beings are living entities and they cannot be governed print, uh, exclusively just by cold, um, shall we say, conceptions of rationality. That is not to say that humans are not rational or should not be rational. But there is also a side that transcends that. And especially when that goes to certain ethical values that go to the core of our personal happiness, even if you leave aside God for the time being, like say when you're born as a child, there's something quite sublime about the relationship of the child to its mother. Mm. So take that as something sacred in human life, even if you don't give a theological import or purport to it, but just within human society. So there is something sacred about that, something sublime about that. So the relationship of the child with the mother. So similarly, because the cow is giving us milk and all through our life, so she, we revere her as our mother. And just as we don't throw out the mother from the house because she gets old and quote unquote unproductive, she can't cook for us anymore. She can't clean the house for us anymore. So let's throw her out of the house. We don't do that. Or we're not supposed to do that. Although it does happen nowadays. Mm. So because we're so accustomed to throwing the cows out, mother cow, out to the slaughterhouse, society over the generations has also become less resistant towards throwing the biological mother out of the house as well. And today we have come to the point where it's not just less resistant, but that's the norm. In, in most countries of the world or in many countries of the world today, you will find a large section of people who go apart from their parents, they can't stay with their parents, or they ask, they live separately because they can't, they don't want to live with their parents. And probably the parents don't want to live with their children. You know, so in many cases in India, there are so many cases that matters have gone up to the Supreme Court and the courts have expressed great anguish at the fact that uh, children are not looking after their elderly parents. Of course, sometimes there are, uh, you know, issues of a different sort that they, you know, parents may have a certain personality and, you know, they, you know, yeah, of they, they create their own problems, etc. So that's a complicated issue. But the point is that the culture that promotes disposing of animals and other entities in your life that are so useful to you and to whom you should be very grateful, it will eventually descend into a culture where you even dispose of humans who are very close to you. The kind of disregard mm. or the, shall we say, callous approach towards animals that we have will also progressively get translated into our dealings with humans. I think it was Pythagoras, you know, the famous Pythagoras yeah. theorem. Pythagoras, who yeah. said one time that, uh, I'm, I'm, not, it's not, I'm not quoting verbatim, just you know, paraphrasing it. He said that a, for a person who does not see anything objectionable in killing animals, will eventually find nothing objectionable in killing humans. Or something, something to that effect. Exactly. So here it may not be direct killing even, but the fact that you've rejected the cow, mother cow from your home, also means you reject your mother from your home. You know? We're talking of the principle of it, not getting into the practicalities or the complexities mm. of all these relationships. Yeah. All that. We're not getting into that. Mm. So I think it's largely this. So at the root of our social uh, fabric lies uh, our practice or our attitudes towards those 
who give us so many valuable things in life. Mm. If you're not grateful to mother cow for what she has given you, how can you be grateful to your mother, biological mother, and how can you be grateful to others around you? So this is an ethical-logical argument. That's a nice way of putting it, yeah. Uh, ethical, but there's a logic to it there. Mm. We could say that on one level, to lose your rationality is bad, but maybe to lose everything for the sake of rationality is worse. To reduce Absolutely. everything to rationality could be terrible. In fact, many of the, say, the ideologies like Marxism or communism, they, they were very rational at one level. Even Nazism at one level seemed rational to people who were trying to implement it. They wanted to create a super race. Uh, so, but you humans are not just governed by reason. So at a rational level, the idea that everybody should be equal, it appeals. And we will create a system of equality in society. Yeah. That rationality actually led to probably the greatest catastrophe in human history. So Marxism caused more violence than First World War and Second World War combined together in Russia and uh, China. Yes, yes. So, and Cambodia and so many other places. Yes, that's true. So now, just to maybe we'll come toward the last concluding summary kind of thing. But uh, if uh, as devotees are to work with vegans, so I have seen that at least in Western outreach centers in, our, in, in the West, even the devotees, the food that they prasad that they give is vegan. So, and they announce specifically that we are having vegan food. And uh, as, as you said, at an individual level for devotees, it would be a personal choice that they will have to make the decision based on what, what seems best for them. Uh, are there any areas where if somebody is a vegan and they still feel that uh, I, I can't, you know, I just can't accept the idea of using animals. What you say sounds good hypothetically, but it doesn't work out like that. Once we humans start using animals, the human greed will come into the picture and boundaries will be crossed. So if somebody is a strong vegan, and that's what, in one sense, comes first for them. So to what extent is it possible for veganism and bhakti to work together at an individual level and at a, maybe at a more of a social transformational level? Well, I think there are two things here. One is, is the principle of accepting or not accepting an animal product, thinking that uh, utilizing an animal product automatically employs exploitation and cruelty. The principle of not taking any animal product. And mm -hmm. second is the practical feasibility of actually ha <clears throat> having uh, ahimsa or non-cruelty in the usage of animal products. Okay. Now, if the vegan is vegan because of point number two, because if it is yes, I, 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 I've understood the principle that if things are done without cruelty, if they are genuinely done with love and devotion, and there are some examples we see, maybe few, but there are some examples, then yes, I would be open to taking milk products here or other products which are not born out of cruelty, but to blanket, just wipe out everything, I think that would be an incorrect understanding of devotional service because you may have your reservations about the practical feasibility of, of implementing non-cruel practices. And you, you'll be justified in that because that's what the whole world is doing now. And if you abstain from that, I think we, we, are, we, have, we sympathize with that. And largely we also follow that. Hmm. But we would urge the vegans who, who on the first, on principle, 
um, don't want to take animal products by explaining to them this the philosophical thing that we have discussed so far uh, because of course a vegan can chant Hare Krishna of course a vegan can worship the deities the worship the vegan can do everything that we as devotees do mm. but there'll be something missing because ultimately Krishna was a coward boy Krishna had milk, he had butter, his pastimes with butter and so on. The whole civilization was centered around milk. So when you have an in principle objection to humans consuming milk, then we have a theological problem here. Hmm. How can your faith remain very strong? Yes. So the practical feasibility, doubts about the practical feasibility of non-cruel practices Oh, okay, we appreciate that, but the principle must become clear. At least they must be convinced of that in course of time. That's that's a succinct uh, statement. I was thinking from a vegan's perspective, uh, what does bhakti provide them? Normally, we humans ask this question: What's in it for me? So we could say the bhakti of veganism is a. We could say it's a worldview based on compassion. At the same time, bhakti offers us not just a worldview, but an entire, um, a, a, or you could say a broader worldview in which all of existence is infused with a higher purpose. This is, you know, ultimately we are all looking for meaning and purpose in life. And if we could have the compassion that is at the heart of the vegan worldview, but even if we care for animals, even if we ethically treat animals, or we ethically treat humans for that matter, ultimately there is, uh, there is survival of the fittest and ultimately even the fittest don't survive. So we may have to talk about what is the ultimate meaning of life. And then there is a grand worldview which includes all living beings uh, as on a journey of spiritual evolution. And uh, we humans are at a particular level in that spiritual evolution. The animals are at a particular level. And you know, we all can cooperate. So when we take honey from a honeybee and we offer that honey to Krishna, then it is the honey is a soul temporarily when the honey is taken that might be some pain for them for the honey the honey is driven away honey is, sorry the bees are driven away and maybe you, we don't kill them but we use fire or something to drive them away but still after that when the honey is offered we, what is going to happen is those bees are going to be benefited because every soul is ultimately longing for the divine so now we may say this is I don't believe this but then do we really believe that life has no meaning and that we are all just, we live according to principles that we hold sacred? And then just one casual blow by a moving car or a bug entering into our body ends our lives. So, what about uh, being open to a worldview that uh, infuses meaning into the existence of all living beings? Even those living beings that don't consciously search for meaning. We humans consciously seek meaning and purpose. Animals mostly live driven by biological impulses, physical drives. But still, we have this grand worldview. And this worldview also, so we can include the compassion of the vegan worldview within the bhakti worldview. But we also get an overall sense of meaning and purpose. So that's what, so the vegan might have to give up some ideas, but that what they gain could be much, much more. Absolutely, because the vegan is driven by a feeling of compassion. That is what drives the vegan to not eat or, or utilize animal products. Hmm. But in Krishna consciousness, the vegan will find not just compassion, but the highest conception of compassion. 
you know, compassion that uh, spans and not just the uh, animal species, but a compassion that is much broader in scope and much deeper, much broader in the sense of not just animals, but the insects and uh, trees and plants and rivers and, and the whole universe and human beings, but also deeper from the material level to the spiritual level. So the conception of compassion that uh, Krishna consciousness can give the vegans is something that is much broader and much deeper and also something that can take us much higher. You know, so I think it was in the Nectar of Devotion where uh, Prabhupada says in the preface, I think it is where the, uh, from a child, you know, the, the, uh, our, our, our circle of love keeps expanding and expanding and expanding according to our level of awareness of the world around us. For a child, it loves its parents because of the family because that's all the child knows. And then as its radius increases, its, its in interaction with the world increases, then its worldview increases. Mm. So it's a question now of deepening, broadening, and heightening the worldview of veganism. And that's what Krishna consciousness can provide. <clears throat> As I said, veganism is, and any form of environmental activism of this sort, uh, is incomplete because it's only dealing with Mother Nature and not Father God. And even though they may be initially reluctant to hear about God, mm. but even if we approach it from a point of view of, of rationality, logic, ethics, uh, and all of that, eventually if they can be brought to understand the sublime logic and rationality in Krishna consciousness, then they will accept it. Yes. That's true. If we, without some spiritual dimension to our life, even the most compassionate worldview ultimately yeah. is confronted with the tragedy of death. Yes. And is death within a materialistic worldview, no matter how ennobling it is, death is the ultimate destroyer of meaning. Yes. And uh, we, if we have a spiritual worldview, which also is... There is a lot of rationality in it. There is also a lot of uh, sensitivity and compassion in it. Yes. Then it can add much more uh, depth to our compassion and depth to, to our search for meaning. And it can take that compassion to its perfection. Yes, that's true. So I think uh, we have a lot in common. There's a lot we agree with, with the vegans. Yeah. And there are some things that we would beg to defer. Yes. And, but the vegans are welcome to come. And if they come to our programs, if, if uh, as you said, some of our centers and temples have vegan-only diets, it's mm. okay. But if they have access to ahimsa milk and so on, if you want to have another section that says ahimsa milk products, mm. So this is the vegan section, this is the Ainsimil, so people can choose whichever they like. They can take both this also and then they can go there. And if it's someone who's a staunch vegan and who doesn't want to take the milk products, then he's not obliged to do so. Yeah. He or she has a separate vegan diet available. And for others, they can take the vegan plus the milk products. That, that, would, be, that would make it very acceptable if you have your space, but if you want to go out of your space, your com comfort, your safe space or comfortable space, there's option yeah. for that also in a reasonably, so you can come out of your comfort zone in a comfortable way, not yes. in a, not in a disconcerting way. Yeah. That would be very nice if we could do like and that. It's an opportunity for some discussion. Okay. This is vegan diet and this is ahimsa milk. What is, what's the meaning of ahimsa milk? What do you mean? And, uh, how does it work and you know some discussions so hopefully that can broaden the horizons 
Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Should we just try to summarize before we conclude? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we went over a lot of subjects, but if I look at the structure, we started with the rise of veganism. So it's uh, as the industrialization of uh, animal farming uh, spread, it led to a lot of violence and a, a natural sensitive response to that violence was we don't know, we have been using, are we using animals, so we want to avoid it. And then we originally, this, uh, if we go further back, the Abrahamic or Christian worldview desacralized nature by considering that spirit or soul is present only in humans. And then the scientific technological worldview removed moderation. If there is no other world we are supposed to go to, then for making this world into paradise, just exploit all the resources. So that's how this happened. Now in India, traditionally there has been vegetarianism for a long time. But now because of uh, Western influence, as well as uh, uh, ethos of rebellion against what is perceived as Brahminical authorit authoritativeness, uh, to some extent, non-vegetarianism has become quite, uh, it's become fashionable now. Although to a small extent, say India with respect to West is maybe 20, 30 years behind. So the vegan culture is slowly coming in. So that is, uh, and Prabhupada also contributed significantly to the rising of uh, the at least the vegetarian alternative by both emphasizing it as important for one's development of spiritual consciousness and by providing the, a delicious array of uh, vegetarian foods. Yeah. Anything to add in this point, the history of veganism? Yes, I think you have succinctly summarized okay. the main points. Okay. Yes. Then we talk about where they di where veganism and bhakti diverge. And uh, so I spoke about veganism basically considers any use of animals for uh, human consumption as bad because that will lead to abuse. So there is compassion, but that, that is idea of segregation is something which uh, which is not what is and always seen in nature. And then with respect to, so there is a philosophy, there is an ideological, a philosophical aspect and a practical aspect. So if practically somebody is vegan, we can also be vegans in certain situations. But ideologically, we understand that uh, God has created nature in an interdependent way. Correct. And we could harmonize, we could live harmoniously, and not just harmoniously, but it could be symbiotically where both flourish. Yes. And for that, you suggested uh, certain recommend ideas of how that harmony or synergy could work. So you would like to repeat that? I think first you mentioned five points, and then second time yeah. you mentioned specifically with respect to cows. Yes, yes. I'd say the first point is that it must be the, the proposed use of anything in the environment. Now I'm expanding the scope from just veganism, or just food, to just anything, because the vegans also believe that they also expand the scope to clothing and so on. And I'm expanding it even further. So the first criterion is whether it is recommended by or is permitted by or at least not prohibited by okay. scripture. Okay, the first thing. Mm. And if it is not, then no question of going further. Mm. We don't go further. How, however beneficial something may be. For example, uh, everything in nature has benefits. Opium may have its benefits, but that doesn't mean that we would partake of it. Mm. Okay. So that's the first point. Scriptural authorization. Uh, number two would be that we, sh we should use it with no cruelty or minimum cruelty because zero cruelty is not possible. Yeah. You know, we, can, we should live with minimum possible uh, pain caused. Hmm. Right? And third, not only minimum pain and cruelty, 
but it should actually be done with a lot of devotion with love environment yeah the feeling of love which will come for a devotee because a devotee loves krishna so automatically having loved krishna the, uh, the devotee loves everything connected to krishna and sees the entire creation mm -hmm. as the energy of krishna as a property of krishna as inseparable from krishna so therefore there is a sense of love understanding that connection so it has to be done with love next is that uh, because the devotee wants to do things in a sattvic way in a in a mode of goodness therefore uh, things should be utilized in moderation mm. excessive consumption of any sort would not be good it would go against the principle of harmonious interdependence it would topple the balance the delicate fragile balance that exists mm. so moderation is an important word here and finally the fifth point is about offering what we have to krishna what we have proposing to use we first offer to krishna with love and then we accept that as prasadam so this was a uh, broadly for any any animal product that we may use and specifically i think for cows you mentioned certain things that the uh, the cow and mother should not be the cow and calf shouldn't be separated that the calf should be fed adequately the cow should not be given any artificial chemicals for their uh, for increasing the milk or whatever from them and then uh, they should be given land for grazing for moving not just stock and of course they should even if they stop giving milk they shouldn't be slaughtered were these the five points or there anything else and you have also implemented this in the mother cow dairy to some extent uh, for the first five points that i mentioned you know about the scripture authorization etc that was not yeah. only for food items it could be expanded to so many other things any interaction with nature we could say yeah that's yeah. Just, yeah so coming to cows i would say it's not only this five uh, i would say the first and most important is that the cow should be protected okay and at the very minimum protection means don't kill yeah so let them live till their natural death hmm. second look after the cows and bulls with love and devotion okay third um don't inject all sorts of chemicals hormones unnecessary antibiotics and so on and so forth uh into the cow just to increase your milk production and so on mm. number 4 don't confine the cow you know 24 hours a day to the stalls uh where they're confined almost imprisoned and they're not allowed to move let them have opportunity for grazing for free grazing as far as possible and even if it's not possible to graze at least have them some some area to move around or just exercise or you know something so when the you mentioned this will be that minute, when you mentioned this i thought that maybe during the current lockdown we get some sense of how cows have to live throughout their life if yes. they are in a complete <laughs> constant <laughs> yes 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 and to live life lifelong like that would be terrible actually yeah yes and then also that uh, about this artificial milking uh, they on they're almost 24 hours the machines are on that's true and sometimes they it causes pain sometimes it causes injury they ex sometimes the machines extract pus and blood which mixes into the milk and you know so all these things happen and finally very very importantly that the calf should not be separated from the cow mm. and the calf should be allowed to drink milk from its mother to its full satisfaction and human beings may take milk that is in excess of what the cow drink of what the calf drinks mm. so these are the criteria that need to be satisfied in order to have milk that is truly ahimsa yes and then we discussed about if ahimsa milk is not available 
we try as much as possible to get it to create systems so that it can be got but then if yeah. it is not available then whether to take the usual milk or to avoid milk that's a matter of individual preference individual choice yes. Yes. and then we discussed about how you know as devotees we could accommodate vegans and what so we could have vegan food available and ahimsa food available and that way also we appreciate the compassion that is there within uh, the vegan world view but what bhakti can offer to veganism is a bigger world view where life itself has spiritual meaning and we see all living beings included and as the compassion can be expanded uh, to beyond the physical level and beyond the animals to all of nature and all of the com- complete being so that's why uh, the vegan compassion with uh, with the bhakti vision could become like a very powerful social transformative force right absolutely you summarize things very nicely mm-hmm. and i think just a minor point that um, i might like to mention here which we discussed very briefly was about other items that yes. vegans don't consume apart from milk and milk derivatives which is honey mm. and wool silk yeah and whatever principles we have for uh, the milk i would say similar principles would apply although it's like differences would apply to uh, honey and wool and silk mm. meaning that it must be done in a non violent way non cruel way you know so sheep can be sheared but without causing harm to the sheep you know there are problems one of the things that we can object about is that uh, sometimes in order to get more wool they shear the sheep uh, before the winter season begins just before so that uh, by the time is winter the sheep is without its natural warm clothing and many times the sheep die because of exposure to cold oh. or sometimes they you know so various sorts of problems in rearing so the objections that the vegans have towards sheep rearing for example is of a more practical nature mm. and there are important points that they make so if at all as devotees we we utilize wool also in fact wool and silk in the vedic culture are considered pure items you know if you wear cotton clothes and uh, you go on the altar or something or you you know then you have to eventually after you perspire or whatever then you have to wash them you can't wear cotton clothes again and again without washing them but silk and wool are two materials which are considered pure enough that suppose you have a shawl or something or uh, you know something of of uh, silk or wool you need not wash it obviously it will get soiled at some point either with perspiration if you're wearing a kurta made of silk for example then naturally you would like to wash it after one use even because it might Uh, we can you know uh, soiled but in general if it's like a shawl or something then you would lo- it, it's okay to to if you just kept it on if it hasn't get so obviously soiled then uh, it's considered pure enough for repeat use without washing yes. so uh, for wool that's important for silk also now that's a very obvious case because mm. in the modern way they they rear silk worms is they put the cocoons in boiling water so the the uh, worms die a horrible death right they are basically hot boiling water whereas ahimsa silk means that you let the moths to let the larva or the larvae grow into moths naturally and they break open the cocoon and emerge and let them emerge and, and live their life and but because the cocoon is broken then you have the uh, the yarn you know which is now snipped it's in bits and pieces and also it's lesser in quantity because uh, it takes so many more days for the moth to come out 
So some of the silk yarn is already degenerated. So the quantity of yarn that you get is less. The length of every yarn that you get is less. And therefore, it doesn't fetch a high price in the market. On the contrary, uh, ahimsa still becomes much more expensive mm. in terms of money. But in terms of karmic cost that you have to pay, the normal silk is very expensive. Mm. So as devotees, you know, we should be aware. Just like now we are talking, we're having this discussion about ahimsa milk. We should also be having this discussion about ahimsa honey, ahimsa wool, ahimsa silk. They should also get into our consciousness that ultimately to broaden our lifestyle and make it the purity of our lifestyle, physical lifestyle, you know, we will have to consider these things at some point. We need not wait till some other movement comes up in the secular world yes. and we follow suit. That's beautiful. So these are also some things, even pearls. Pearls, uh, they don't use pearls, I think, because oh. they come from visitors. Yeah, that's right. So we also discussed one point was if somebody considers the, the, the Vedic veneration of cows as irrational, if they call yes. it holy cows, you quite articulately said that we could also say holy dogs and holy cats. So we discussed that... Uh, Basically, we cannot reduce relationships to pure to, to soul rationality alone. So to lose rationality is bad, but to, but to be, lose everything except rationality could well be worse. So we need to also yeah. recognize that uh, the cows are a part of a, of a harmonious ecosystem in the traditional Indian culture. And uh, con actually humans... Uh, enhance the natural ecosystem of the cows. Don't interfere with it. As humans can protect them and provide them their needs and uh, keep them safe. So, if, if this kind of model could be seen by vegans, then I'm sure many of them would become much more receptive to bhakti. In fact, they would feel empowered by bhakti to take the veganism to a to take their compassion to a higher level. Yes. Yes. And to recognize that there is an acceptable give and take hmm. system. Yes, yeah, so I talked about the yeah. pendulum, I think. One was animals, one extreme of the pendulum is animals are solely for human consumption. Yes. The other is we, have not, we can take nothing from the animals. So yeah. the other extreme, the balance would be that we take in a, in a harmonious way, take in a compassionate, in a way that is kind and loving. Yes, so and not only take, but is give also. Give. Yes, like we take milk from the cows, but we give the cows protection. We give the cows love. Mm. You know, so there is a give and take. So we have an acceptable bandwidth of give and take. Okay, beautiful. Yes, and and we have to function within that. So there are certain gives and take that you that are not acceptable. And there are certain, there's a bandwidth of give and take that is okay for us to follow. Yes, that's true. So, if uh, someone has any questions, we will be broadcasting this soon. And if someone has some questions, probably we could take them in a future discussion also on yes. this issue. And sure. I would, I'm grateful that you were, you spared your time today. And I would look, look, be very grateful and look forward to it if we could. Continue such discussions in the future. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. Uh, I really enjoyed this discussion. And so many nice, you made so many nice points uh, very articulately and eloquently. Mm -hmm. And I hope that those who, are, who watch this will also get some inspiration uh, in matters of, of such a nature. And yes, definitely. Um, I'll be happy to have further discussion, especially with respect to questions that come up on this topic. And I think time has passed. Like, how long has it been since we started this discussion? It's more than two hours, actually. It's really? Two hours, 15 minutes. Yeah, we didn't know how the time passed. Thank you so much. You know, apart from whatever I contributed, I think you had a, you have been on the ground and a lot of 
tangible practical points also you were able to give which i'm sure many people would be benefited from it so i look forward to future discussions thank you very much for joining charan prabhu hare krishna thank Shri you prabhu ki jai bahut pande hari jai hare krishna